we're delighted he's here. My name is uh, Kurt V. Brands. I want to welcome you all to the 2016 George Washington Leadership Lecture. I'm delighted to be here for this program and delighted to have you all here. I'd like to first thank Mary Beth Borthwick, who is uh, at once class of USC 1973 and also the Vice Regent for California of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. And Mary Beth and her husband Hal very graciously funded this series. And I'm really grateful for their support. So uh, Mary Beth and Hal's gifts supported the creation of a partnership between the Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington and the University of Southern California's Saul Price School of Public Policy, convening students, scholars, historians, and the general public from across the country. This partnership provides an ongoing exploration of George Washington's lifelong accomplishments, his leadership lessons, also helping the public to gain better understanding of George Washington as a man, a leader, and his legacy. And I'm really pleased to be joined tonight by Chris Fox, who is here to give a welcome from USC. Uh, Chris, I can call you Chris, that's all right. Yeah, Chris Chris is a first year law student at George Georgetown University Law Center. He is also a recent graduate of USC Saul Price School of Public Policy. And during his studies, he worked as a research fellow at USC's Center for the Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorist Events under the tutelage of professor and former FBI special agent, Dr. Errol G. Southers. Chris is also integral to the Foreign Fighters Project, uh, a very topical subject. He, he did qualitative research on homegrown violent extremism in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area that was produced for the Department, Department of Homeland Security. Um, after graduation, he was hired to work as a project coordinator for USC Price, where he continued to conduct research and engage in fundraising activities. Prior to his time at USC, Chris served as for seven years as a special operator in the US Air Air Force, where he led a troop of 13 Air Commandos. And for his action in combat, he earned the Bronze Star Medal and Air Force Commendation Medal with Valor, among other decorations. I, I also should say, Chris, that you are uh, perhaps going to return to the FBI, and you've been doing FBI training prior to doing this, and so we're, it's just really great to have you here to do this. Um, so I just want a big hand for Chris Fox. Thank you for being here, Chris. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Kurt. And good evening, everyone. Um, as a proud alumnus of the USC Soul Price School of Public Policy, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's lecture. In 2013, the USC Price School of Public Policy and the Fred W. Smith National Library partnered to launch the George Washington Leadership Lecture Series. These events explore President Washington's lifelong accomplishments, providing a better understanding of him as a person, as well as his remarkable leadership professional achievements, and lasting legacy. This collaboration, again, we'll mention, was made possible by the generous support of Mary Beth and William Borthwick. Mary Beth is a distinguished USC alumna and serves as the Vice Regent for California of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. We're very excited to carry on this series, now in its third year. We hold one lecture on each coast, and so on January 25th, we'll host the Los Angeles lecture at the USC campus featuring NPR correspondent Nina Totenberg. I invite you all to attend that event as well, and it gives you a good reason to take a break from the cold weather. Some of you may not be familiar with the USC Price School and the work that we do, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. That Our mission is to improve the quality of life for people and their communities all around the world. Established more than 80 years ago, we're one of the oldest public affairs schools nationwide, and today we're ranked fourth according to U.S. News and World Report as of this year. USC Price is a truly interdisciplinary school with academic programs in the fields of public administration, nonprofit leadership, health policy and management, public policy, and urban planning, and now real estate development. We're also the proud home to the ROTC program at USC and it's the largest continually operating ROTC program in the country. It never left. In weaving together these diverse disciplines and reaching across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, the Price School is uniquely positioned to address head-on society's most pressing challenges. In many ways, George Washington's work aligns closely with that of the Price School. 
He was a government leader, a military leader, a surveyor, a city planner of Washington, D.C., a real estate developer in Ohio, and an innovator in disease prevention, wound care, and nutrition at Valley Forge. Together with the Fred W. Smith National Library, we look forward to advancing the study of George Washington and promoting the values he embraced, including lessons in leadership, which is the focus of tonight's talk. Washington himself said that one of our primary objectives as a country should be the education of our youth and the science of government. He asked, in a republic, what species of knowledge can be equally important? And what duty more pressing than communicating it to those who are to be the future guardians of the liberties of this country? This evening, we have the privilege of learning about these topics from the expertise of Dr. Douglas Bradburn and FBI Director James Comey. We look forward to a great discussion. Thank you. I should introduce Doug Bradburn, who is the director of the Fred W. Smith National Library. I know many of you know him. Um, uh, we've done a lot under Doug's leadership at the library, which has really uh, allowed us to expand significantly the number of people that we're reaching uh, here at Mount Vernon. But we are really, really grateful for this partnership with USC because it's an incredibly impressive institution and one that you know we, we want to continue and grow our relationship. Uh, it's, it's my honor now to introduce tonight's guest speaker, James B. Comey. He is the seventh director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, having been sworn in on September 4th, 2013. The FBI's motto is fidelity, bravery, and integrity and describes the 36,000 men and women that serve our country under Director Comey's leadership. Those words, fidelity, bravery, and integrity, can also be used to describe the first president of the United States and the man we and the Saul Price School honor with this lecture series. Uh, Director Comey is a graduate of the College of William and Mary and of the University of Chicago Law School. After graduating from law school, he served as assistant to the United States Attorney for both the Southern District of New York and the Eastern District of Virginia. And uh, he was for a time in private practice as well in Richmond, and he was actually an adjunct professor at the University of Richmond School of Law. He uh, returned to New York to be the U.S. Attorney for the state's Southern District. In 2003, he was named Deputy Attorney General for the Department of Justice in the United States. And two years later, he left DOJ to serve as General Counsel and Senior Vice President President at Lockheed Martin. In 2010, Director Comey joined Bridgewater Associates, a Connecticut-based investment fund, as its general counsel. Tonight, Director Comey will talk about leadership lessons he has learned on his pathway to becoming the FBI director, as well as particular style of leading our nation's top law enforcement agency. And I know that he will also try and see some parallels from what he's learned about General Washington himself. Uh, and uh, following his uh, lecture, we'll have the opportunity, you will, to address questions. Uh, you, I think, have had the opportunity to get some cards as you came in. If you uh, want to write those questions on the card, we'll collect them and then we'll use those to, uh, to ask some questions at the end of his lecture. So with that, I just want to say thank you very much, Director Cooley, for being here. It's really a privilege for us to have you here. And I have a big hand of applause. Big round of applause. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you for those words. Chris, thank you for those words. Let's get the law school thing done and get back to the Bureau. Uh, we have lots of folks who are both special forces and lawyers, so you're perfectly qualified. Well, you may be perfectly qualified, uh, so hope you'll come back. Uh, thank you to Mount Vernon and to USC Price for asking me to come speak today. It's a little daunting, frankly, to be speaking about leadership here at the home of George Washington. I feel like he casts a much longer shadow, maybe not physically since I'm 6'8", but much, much longer shadow in the question of leadership, metaphorically, than I do. And so I'm humbled by the opportunity to talk at his home about how I think about leadership, some of the things that I have tried to learn as a leader, and some of the things I've learned about George Washington, both before becoming a leader and that have confirmed some of the things that I think are important to leadership. I'd like to share those thoughts with you very, very briefly, and then I want to take your questions, which will be the fun part. 
So let me start by think, talking about leadership and tell you what I think the goal of all leaders is, and that is to help their people achieve their goals. To help their people be as good as they can possibly be, and by doing that to make possible their dreams, their hopes, their objectives, to facilitate their people in being great. When people think about leadership in a whole lot of government and the private sector, I think they think and talk about it backwards. I think most places people talk about the same categories of leadership attributes that I think of, but do it in a different way than I do. Most people talk about skills, that is, what are the things you've learned to do, what are the jobs you've inherited, how did you do in those jobs? And then they talk next about your abilities, what are the things you do well, either by nature or by nurture, good conceptual thinker, great under pressure, good communicator, great logical thinker, creative, imaginative, those kinds of capabilities. And then last, if at all, when people are evaluating leaders, they talk about their values. What kind of people are they? How are they oriented in life? Do they care about others? Are they people of integrity? Are they people of centeredness? Are they people who aspire to do something greater than themselves? What are they like? I actually have come to learn that the way to evaluate leaders is not from skills through abilities to values, but to actually start this way. Because if a leader has the right values and the right abilities, they can learn anything. But if you hire and promote backwards and start with, so what are their skills, what jobs have they had, you may miss the fact that they don't have the abilities you need and the values you need. So those are the two framings I want to start with. And then I want to talk to you about what I think are the essential elements of leadership. And you're going to hear me entirely in a combination of the values and abilities buckets. I'm not going to talk much about skills, because as I said, that's the least important thing in understanding the capabilities, the potential of someone who might be a leader. I actually boil down the essential elements of a leader to two seemingly contradictory pairs of attributes. Kindness and toughness, confidence and humility. They seem like they're contradictory, but if you look at the great leaders of this nation, starting with George Washington, you see that combination that seems like a contradiction, but is actually a source of tremendous strength. So let's start with what I know about George Washington. I'm sure I'm surrounded by people who know more about George Washington than I. There's no doubt that George Washington was tough. There's no doubt that George Washington held his people accountable, often very, very severely, when measured against high standards. But George Washington was also kind and understood how to inspire in his people almost a love and an affection for himself and for their mission. George Washington was somehow able to, as one of his biographers said, Richard Brookheiser, said he would use consistently the same phrase. It would be, my brave men. And he would use it in all different kinds of contexts. My brave fellows, he would say. My brave fellows, I ask you to enlist, to re-enlist. My brave fellows, fight. As Brookheiser said, Washington was getting them to be brave by telling them that they were brave, by telling them that he cared deeply about them because they already embodied this essential element. Washington's toughness and kindness, I think, made him the model for leadership, but so did that combination, that second combination of humility and confidence. The best leaders are people who are comfortable enough in their own skin to surround themselves with great talent and be open to learning from that talent. They're people who are comfortable enough in their own skin to listen well, which is something that insecure people struggle with mightily. When you think about Washington, think about the talent he surrounded himself with. Just, I'm not going to name drop on you, but let me drop Adams, Jefferson, Hamilton, and Madison, among others. <laughs> We're talking about brilliant and well-read people of extraordinary accomplishment and not themselves without ego. He surrounded himself with this kind of talent as the first president of the United States because he understood and had the confidence to get better as a result of their presence. But it required a centeredness, a sense of self that allowed him to be comfortable enough to listen to these people and to learn from them. But at bottom, it also required enough confidence to insist that whatever the advice, the decision was his. 
and that whatever the final decision was made, it was a testament to his own judgment and his own character. So listening, but not being dominated by the talent around him. And I want to say a word about listening in particular, because I think this is actually at the center of leadership. Everyone talks about how communication is a very important part of leadership. There's no doubt about that. This kind of communication, me blathering at somebody, is an important part of leadership. But actually, a form of communication that does not involve active speaking is more important in my view, and that is listening. I have been married for 29 years, and I dated my amazing spouse for seven years before that. It took a long time to convince her of a lot of things. Um, and during all those years, it's been a continual journey, a project underway for her to teach me things. And one of the things she had taught me is what real listening is. Because I was one of those people who thought I knew what real listening was. I obviously discarded what I'll call the Washington Listen, which is your words reaching my ears, actually be coming inside in my ears and actually reaching my brain. Really that period of silence while I wait to say what I already planned to say, <laughs> while I wait to say what an idiot you are. I knew that wasn't really listening. Silence alone, alone is not real listening. I was somebody who mistakenly thought that real listening was silence on my part, your words reaching my brain, and me actually consciously processing what you're saying. And what I discovered is the real listening is silence, plus your words reaching my brain, plus something else that's odd, which is an active communication from the listener that I need to know what you're saying, that I need what is coming out of your mouth. Please give it to me. Please give it to me. And a good listener, which I aspire to be, and it's a continuing journey, is sending those messages with the shoulders, with the face, with weird sounds. If you've ever watched two great friends communicate, you could not put it down if you're a stenographer because they're talking over each other and one's going like this, mm-hmm, no, I, oof, oof, no, I've seen, it's fragments of sentences, it's words, it's sounds. What's going on there is that the listener is pulling from the speaker what that person has to say. Now, why am I telling you this standing here at George Washington's home? Washington was an extraordinary listener. People who wrote about him at the time and have written about him since comment on that. John Furling, who many of you may know is a leading historian of the American Revolution, has written that Washington was unsurpassed as a listener. He listened to those who criticized his mistakes during the French and Indian War, and he learned from those mistakes and got better. During the War of Independence, he listened to Congress, as painful as that was. Back in the day, it was painful to listen to Congress. Um, <laughs> as painful as that was. And he listened to the states, as difficult as that could be. He listened to advice from his own generals, people he outranked. He learned from it, and he acted upon it. The challenge of active listening, the, the kind of, that third state of the world, is that it requires an extraordinary amount of confidence. Because to actually listen well as a leader, among the messages you need to send to the person speaking is, you know something that I need to know. And what is that? It's a confession of weakness. Insecure people struggle mightily with this. Because insecure people are exposed if they send a message, especially to people who work for them, that they need to know what they are saying. So insecure people struggle to expose themselves to pull the words out of somebody, especially somebody who works for them. Another obstacle to listening is the double bind of the imposter complex. The imposter complex is the notion that if you really knew me, if you really knew me, you would think less of me. Okay? All of us have that to one degree or another. If you don't, you're an unbelievable jerk. <laughs> so, every single one of us, I hope, is afflicted by, in some measure, a sense that if people knew me the way I know, really, I know me, they wouldn't think I was such hot stuff. But here's why that's such an impediment to listening. I'm the boss, and one of my folks is going to speak to me. I'm worried about being exposed, because I labor under the imposter complex. But it's a double bind, because the person speaking to me is speaking to the director of the FBI. And I could severely injure them with a sound just by going after they speak <laughs> or by making a face. And they know that. And so their fear of being exposed can be paralyzing. And so if I'm going to overcome 
my imposter complex and their imposter complex, I have to be intentional about listening and listening in that weird, third, uncomfortable way. When people come to brief me, I'm giving away my secrets here, when people come to brief me, I turn in my chair and always face the person who's speaking and I open my body and I don't sit with my arms folded, I open my body and I look at them and I work to, you're okay, you're going to be okay, you're going to be okay, to get them to tell me what they need to tell me. And then I'm always careful about how I begin the conversation, how I begin the questioning, because I know, even if I've overcome my own imposter complex, they're laboring under that which can be disabling. Listening, which George Washington did extraordinarily well, is at the heart of being an effective leader and is made possible by that combination of confidence and humility. Another attribute, another capability slash value that I think is at the center of good leadership is judgment. And what I mean by judgment is this, not intelligence. Intelligence is the ability to solve a riddle, to nail an equation, to master a set of facts. It's actually fairly common in nature. Judgment is the ability to take that answer and orbit it and see it through the eyes of others, to see it in different places in time, to move it around. People who solve problems can be very, very bright. They have high IQ. But being smart is a very different thing than being bright. Being smart is having the judgment to see things as they might be seen in different places and times. Where does it come from? mostly the way you were raised. It also comes from making mistakes and learning from them, having the humility to realize you made a mistake and you did this thing that angered people. That is how you protect and nurture judgment. And this is something that stands out about George Washington, is how often his peers commented on just that aspect of his leadership, his extraordinary judgment. John Marshall, the nation's first chief justice, wrote this in his own biography of Washington. More solid than brilliant, judgment rather than genius constituted the most prominent feature of his character. What he's saying, to use my words, Washington, it wasn't about brightness. He was extraordinarily smart. And Thomas Jefferson didn't always love George Washington, didn't always have the most positive things to say about him, said this after George Washington's death. Quote, perhaps the strongest feature in his character was prudence never acting until every circumstance, every consideration was maturely weighed, refraining if he saw doubt, but when once decided going through with his purpose, whatever obstacles imposed, judgment was at the core of his leadership and all great leadership. And I'll give you one other attribute that I'll couch in terms that Washington never would have used. The words emotional intelligence or EQ would never have escaped his lips or any of his peers. But I believe the concept that we now call emotional intelligence is a critical capability of all successful leaders. And what we mean by emotional intelligence is an ability close to judgment to circle a room and see how others might be experiencing you and how others might be experiencing the world. And through that insight, to be able to connect to them, to communicate to them in effective ways. It's a huge part natural, and it's one of those cruel gifts that is given in disproportionate measure, in my experience, to women at birth. But, as part of my own journey, 29 years plus 7, I've learned anyone, if intentional about it, can foster this ability. This ability to understand other people and to connect to them in an effective way. Now it starts with understanding yourself and your own emotions. And you know Washington controlled his fiery temper in extraordinary ways. But someone with high emotional intelligence also focuses on building relationships with others and understanding them and then using those relationships to accomplish the goals that I started out with, that a leader wants to lead his people to accomplish. Washington's career involves a whole lot of this, maybe most famously with the so-called Newburgh conspiracy. As the Revolutionary War drew to a close, officers in the Continental Army grew angry, very angry at Congress because they hadn't been paid. Some even circulated an anonymous letter calling for an unauthorized meeting to discuss disbanding the Army or even rebelling against Congress. So to defuse this crisis, Washington called his own meeting 
with officers to discuss what was going on, but he implied in his invitation to them that he wasn't going to be there. It would be a meeting for them to talk about this problem. And then when the meeting began, Washington unexpectedly showed up. And he denounced the loose talk of mutiny, and he implored his officers to, quote, give one more distinguished proof of unexampled patriotism and patient virtue by trusting Congress to keep its word. And he most importantly did not elevate himself. Instead what he did, he connected to his men and emphasized their personal bond. And he said this, and I want to quote the entire paragraph. As I was among the first who embarked in the cause of our common country, as I have never left your side one moment, but when called from you on public duty, as I have been the constant companion and witness of your distresses, and not among the last to feel and acknowledge your merits, it can, be scar it can scarcely be supposed at this late stage of the war that I am indifferent to your interests. But then his extraordinary emotional intelligence led him to do one more thing. He started reading a letter from a congressman explaining the government's financial troubles. And he stumbled through the first paragraph. And then he fished into his pocket and he retrieved a set of spectacles of new eyeglasses that his men had never seen before. And then he said to his men this, quote, Gentlemen, you will permit me to put on my spectacles, for I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in service to my country. That touch of vulnerability from their otherwise stoic commander overwhelmed his men, as Washington knew it would, overwhelmed them emotionally, and some of them began to weep as they looked upon this aging man who had given so much to them and to this new nation. Washington finished the letter and left without saying another word. And after he left, those officers unanimously abandoned the idea of rebellion. So did Washington engage in a, a bit of theater here? Of course. But it was rooted in truth. It was rooted in his understanding of those great men and how he might touch them and motivate them. It was rooted in his own emotional intelligence, which helped save the American Revolution from collapsing on the very brink of triumph. So that's how I think about the attributes, the combination of abilities and values that mark a great leader. But I should hasten to add here a word of caution. Leadership is not for everyone. I've worked many places that made the classic mistake of saying, you are the greatest rocket scientist in our company. Therefore, you will be an extraordinary leader of other rocket scientists. It is almost never the case that the world-class doer of anything is a world-class coach of a group of people trying to do that same thing. They can search for your own examples. I follow basketball, and so I've tried to come up with examples of people who are Hall of Fame players and Hall of Fame coaches. One of them is from Southern California, another school, and John Wooden, so I don't, want to, I don't want to dwell on that here today. But think about players like Wayne Gretzky, right? The great one. Maybe the greatest hockey player ever on ice. Not so great as a coach. Mike Krzyzewski at Duke. A Midland basketball player. One of, some would argue, the best basketball player, basketball coach in the game today, and the leader in NCAA basketball wins. Those of you who follow baseball this time of year, Tony La Russa was another middling baseball player. I wrote down the stats. 199 batting average, 35 hits in his career, seven RBIs in his entire career, back and forth between the minors and the bigs. In 33 seasons as a manager, helped his team win the World Series three times, six pennants, and 12 division titles. It is a very different thing to be the great doer of something, the great leader of others in doing something. Because to be the great doer of something requires a focus on self that's not illegitimate, it's not unhealthy. How do I get better? How do I push myself harder? How do I make more baskets? How do I get more opportunities? To be the great coach of that group requires a focus in the opposite direction. How do I get them to play better together as a team? How do I motivate him and her and him and her when they're such very different people. It requires a set of abilities very different from the Hall of Fame individual contributor. So to me, having a conversation with people about leadership 
is about having honest conversations about whether someone either has that collection of abilities and values to be a leader, or if they're short in some respects, can develop them to be a successful leader. It's about finding what they are strong at and trying to build on it. But most of all, it's about honest conversations. I'll tell you one of my famous, my favorite honest conversation stories, which is not famous. Um, I thought I could be a high school football player. And so I went out for football as a freshman in high school. And I was not as muscular as I appear today. <laughs> um, and I was much shorter, same size feet, so I was also slow and weak and small. And I got injured three times in the first three weeks. Right? I cut my foot in a bizarre accident in the training room and someone knocked a bench over on me. I, sp I sprained my knee. And I'll tell you a true story, show you a little humility. I was holding a tackling dummy, that was my highest and best use, and someone plowed into it, knocking me and the tackling dummy over backwards. I landed so hard on the tip of my spine that I bruised it. I couldn't sit down. And so I'm at home, and uh, I'm trying to find a way to sit, and my mother comes up, uh, an amazing mother who's uh, since died, but she was an extraordinary influence in my life, and she said, you quit football. And I said, no, I didn't. I'm not going to quit football. I'm going to get back in there. She said, no, no, you quit football. I just went over to the coach's house. <laughs> I was humiliated. But it required someone who loved me enough. Remember I talked about kindness and toughness? I was raised by people who were both. She loved me enough to tell me the truth. You will never be a football player. That is not your strength. Now I draw the line at going and quitting for people. The last thing a leader needs is a reason to lead. A, a leader has to have a passion, some source of meaning at the core of their leadership, else they can't share it with the people that they lead. And obviously Washington had it his, as his passion, his love of country, and his sense of duty, which was overwhelming. What I love about being part of the FBI is I get to do work with moral content. I'm part of an organization that has as its mission protecting the American people and upholding the Constitution of the United States. That for me is a source of meaning all day, every day. It allows me to find fire, even in difficult times, and for me to grieve the notion that I have to leave in seven years. I only have seven left in my 10-year term. Leaders must have a source of passion and of fire in their bellies. So that's how I think about leadership. That's how I think George Washington reflected some of the most important attributes of a leader. I think his leadership gave us a priceless gift, which is an independent nation where everyone is free to pursue their own lives, the blessings of liberty, and to find their own happiness. I believe our responsibility is to protect that gift that we received and pass it on to those who follow us. For that, I believe we need more leaders like George Washington. We need more people who are tough and kind, who have enough confidence to be humble so that they can listen well, so they can make great decisions. And we need them not just in our presidents or our generals. I think we need them in all walks of life. I hope George Washington's example will continue to light the way for us, to inspire us, to shame us when we lose track of those values, and to aspire always to help our people achieve their dreams in a great way. So thank you for listening to me. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you very much, Director Comey. Um, questions from the audience. Uh, can you actually tell us about, it? I mean, you, you effectively retired from the public sector and went to Lockheed Martin, and then you went to work for Bridgewater, uh, and you mentioned earlier the reason to lead, and I can understand completely how you would have decided that this was the highest calling. Uh, did, when, when they called you to ask you to return to the government and to take over the FBI, did you say immediately yes? I mean, were there any reservations you That's had about doing question. it? That's a great question. I never thought I'd get a chance to come back to government. I left with some bumps uh, in, in uh, 2005, and I thought, who's going to invite me back? And so I had actually left Bridgewater in the spring of 2013 and was teaching at Columbia and thinking, maybe I could be a college president or something. But the deal was, my wife was in graduate school, getting a master's so she could work more with foster children. That's her passion. And so the deal was, 
I will be around more, contribute more, and then she will uh, finish this thing. So I get a call from the Attorney General, totally out of the blue, asking me if I'd be willing to be interviewed for FBI director. And I said, I don't think so. That uh, I just think it's too much for my family. I've moved them around. I owe so much to my wife. I said, I don't think so, but I will. I'll tell you what, I'll sleep on it, and I'll call you back in the morning. And I said, but I think the answer is no. So I'll tell you an amazing story about my wife. So I, I go to bed with her, and I wake up in the morning, <laughs> and she's gone. And I go down and find her in the kitchen, and I walk behind her, and she's on her laptop on Zillow.com looking at houses in the D.C. area. <laughs> now, I'm not a great investigator, but uh, so I said, what are you doing? And she said, uh, she said, look, I've known you since you were 19, which is true. She said, this is who you are. This is what you love. And she said, so you, you've got to say yes, you'll be interviewed. And then she said, I'll quote her. She said, but they're not going to pick you anyway. <laughs> I hope you have that kind of support in your lives. She said, they're not going to pick you anyway, so go down there, do your best. That way I won't have your sad face moping around here saying, I could have been FBI director. Uh, and so I remember I called her at a meeting with the president. They went much longer than scheduled, where we each talked about our vision for what the FBI needed, and we both thought it needed a person of independent spirit. And I called her and said, maybe your faith in their poor judgment is not that well placed. And so then... Uh, I took this job, and the deal was I, I lived alone here for two years in Dad's bachelor house while the family uh, stayed in Connecticut while she finished her graduate degree. And so now we have seven years to go. I don't know what I'll do next. She, there won't be anything else in government, she tells me. So we'll see. But that's the story. And so if you reflect on your time in private practice, Huntman Williams, and being at Bridgewater and at uh, Lockheed Martin, how would you sort of describe the similarities and the differences between leading in the private sector and leading in the public sector? It's much easier to lead in the private sector because your toolbox is more full. You can reward people to the upside in, in ways that you simply can't in the government, and you have a flexibility on the downside, too, if someone's not performing, to discipline people much more easily. And so your range is much more narrow, but but I've long believed there's no better place to learn to lead than the government because you have to lead on things like moral content and joy in the work and mission. You have to lead on values, not on rewards or punishments. And I believe the most positive motivators are a combination of guilt and affection. Right? It's, it's what makes the American soldier, sailor, marine, airman so extraordinary. And compare them to the Soviets. The Soviet Red Army would take a hill because there were people behind them with machine guns. So they take the first hill, but the American service member gets to the first hill, and the people look at their watches and say, you know, we got, we got a couple hours of daylight. We could get the next hill. Why? Because they believe in what they're doing. And so I actually think it's a great place to learn. And then when I got to the private sector, I'm like, whoa, look at all these other tools we have. Someone spectacular, I can give them a $100,000 raise. How about that? But at its core, even in the private sector, it's... People aren't in it for the money. And if they are, they're actually not the kind of people that you want. So that's probably the biggest difference between the two. Um, someone wanted to know about uh, your leadership style and its evolution as it relates to sort of your partnership with the CIA. And how has that affected sort of how you think about running the FBI and partnering with them in all that you're doing? The FBI's relationship with the CIA has been transformed in the last 15 years, I'd say. In fact, Justin had a bit of a Rip Van Winkle experience. I don't know if anyone outside of the New York Hudson Valley gets that one. But the, uh, it's as if I went to sleep in a way, because I never thought I was coming back to government. And so I read you know, the Times and the Journal, and, but I didn't follow things that closely. And to come back after eight years and see, for example, that the number two person in the FBI's national security branch is a CIA officer who sits at my table every morning, is in all my most important meetings. It's an awesome penetration by the CIA. <laughs> but they are, but that is symbolic, but also reflects a reality. So there's been a, a knitting together. We have different responsibilities, different authorities, different spheres of operation. But to be effective, we have to knit ourselves together in a good way. It's interesting. We have different cultures. Um, theirs is flatter than ours. Ours is more hierarchical, much more like the military in that way. 
uh, the best example of that I can give you is I went and sp I gave a speech at a graduation at the CIA's training academy, the farm. And afterwards, people are just milling about, having beers. And a woman comes up to me with a clear plastic cafeteria box. And I can see inside her like, big homemade cookies. And there's a little sticker on the top that has a name written on it. And she says, excuse me, Director Comey? I said, yeah. She said, are you going back to headquarters after this? I said, sure. She said, would you mind taking these cookies back? Um, I baked them for a friend of mine who works at FBI headquarters. And so I look at the name. I look at the name and I said, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know her. She said, oh, your secretary will know her. You'll be able to find her. I said, okay. So I, so I took the cookies, got in the car, we went to the FBI plane, I got on the plane, I flew back. Now, I think maybe they were trying to recruit me or something. But it was uh, an example of flatness because no one in the FBI would approach the director of the CIA, and I don't think she was a wingnut. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe in some way. But no one in the FBI would approach the CIA director because it would be perceived as this. And I really think there's an aspect of the CIA culture that it was seen as this. And so we are different in that respect. But yet, in service of the same mission, we have connected ourselves in really, really good ways. What's, what's great about now is if there's a problem, it's the exception. And John Brennan and I talk to each other constantly. If we hear there's a problem somewhere in the world, we jump on it right away. Because we're in such a great place. And again, I didn't do this. Bob Mueller did this and, and uh, the directors before John Brennan did. But we're in such a good place with this knitting together that um, we don't want to spoil it in any way. I, I will say as an aside that having seen you tonight and having had Director Brennan here, we're I feel very good about where we are in the country. Um, can you think back, uh, growing up in Allenhurst, New Jersey, to that moment, or perhaps it was after that, when you felt drawn to public service and what really, you know, what really sparked you? Was it meeting somebody or sort of thinking about, you know, leadership lessons of other people? You know, I was raised, I think of it, I don't remember a particular moment. I was raised in a family where, where service was kind of part of the ethos uh, and and so there was a lot of volunteering my family was very active in church and so I remember doing a lot of that I knew I wanted to do something to help other people and I thought I wanted to be a doctor and I thought that was a way to help people and so I went to college I was a chemistry major and was pre-med all the way through the end of my junior year when I had a crisis I'm like I'm really kind of a crappy chem, chem major so why am I why am I going to, to med school and I switched and decided, what do I do well? I, I think I speak pretty well. I write pretty well. I think I might enjoy being a lawyer and helping people that way. And even then, I didn't know what kind of lawyer I wanted to be. I went to Chicago, and I got a clerkship because uh, the dean at the time, I think, had a crush on my girlfriend, now my wife. And so he um, <laughs> said, so what does that knucklehead want? And she said, he'd like a clerkship. So I got a clerkship in New York. She didn't do anything inappropriate in return, by the way. Um, and I was sitting in the courtroom watching a bail hearing in 1985 and the government was trying to detain fat tony salerno the boss of the genovese crime family and i'm 25 26 and i'm sitting in the jury box watching this the judge would let us watch cool stuff and, and first of all fat tony is right out of central casting he's fat um, <laughs> but he uh, bald head unlit stogie walked with a cane and we didn't like something his lawyer did. He would take out the stogie and yell, Your Honor, it's an outrage. <laughs> and so I'm watching this, and the government is playing tapes that the FBI made underneath Fat Tony's table at the Palma Boy Social Club in East Harlem, which used to be a mob enclave that day, so over near the FDR Drive. And to interpret the tapes, they have on the stand Vincent the Fish Cafaro, <laughs> who looks like a fish, and is a mob cooperator. And so I'm watching this. I'm thinking, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so I go home, and I call my girlfriend, now my wife, and I say, I know what I want to do with my life. She said, what's that? I said, I want to be a federal prosecutor. What's that? And I explained. And I said, I want to do it here in New York, which she always hated. And so it was a big negotiation. And then a year later, I became a federal prosecutor in New York. And, I, and we left after six years. Again, she hated New York. And we moved to Richmond, Virginia. And I went to a law firm because there was a hiring freeze and I couldn't get into the government in 1993. Three years later, the freeze lifted 
And I left. I was a partner at a big law firm. I left and went back to the U.S. Attorney's Office. They thought I needed a psych exam, I think, because um, I had good money. I had matching furniture in my room. I had, I had drapes. I had a parking space. But honestly, my, my, a lot of my colleagues at the firm had never tasted what I had tasted, which is getting up in the morning saying, what's my job today? It's to try and do something good. And so I left and went back to the government and thought that I would stay there for the rest of my career as a federal prosecutor in Richmond, Virginia. That was the plan. We had a five-bedroom colonial, which we walked by the other day to visit. Uh, I had five children, and we paid $252,000 for it. We had great public schools. Holy cow, that was the plan, to retire as a federal prosecutor. And then 9-11 happened, and um, out of the blue, I got a call from the White House asking me to go to New York, to Manhattan, to be the chief federal prosecutor. That's a whole other difficult story for my wife, but we went. <laughs> we went. Uh, but that was, that, that was how I got into public service. And you know, we were talking outside why the FBI, the turnover in the FBI among special agents is 0.5%. That's extraordinary. No matter what they're like, white, black, Latino, Asian, Native American, man or woman, no one leaves. And the reason is because the mission is addictive. It's not about the money. The mission is addictive, to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. That is, that's not a great way to make a living, but it's an, it's an unbelievable way to make a life. And so that's what lit my fire. And that's why I was so sad when I kind of got promoted out of government. And to be back and have a 10-year term, I mean, a president can fire an FBI director, but it's a big deal. And so I'm hoping it will never happen. Um, and so I will be around another seven, how many days, Josh? 25, 27. 2,527 days. Uh, and I keep track of it, not because I'm an inmate, I keep track of it because I will be so sad the day I have to leave this mission and these people. Sorry for that too long answer. I would say, because you were speaking a second ago about the hierarchical uh, organization, I should tell everybody in the audience that um, before we came in here, uh, the director had the opportunity to meet Michael Caine. Where's Michael Caine? He's here. I, know, I, don't, I don't know where he's sitting, but he's in the back, way in the back. And Michael Caine worked at the Fred W. Smith uh, National Library for the study of George Washington until January of this year. And at that moment, his lifelong dream was fulfilled, and he was called to the FBI. And so Michael uh, graduated in April 16th, and he's now an analyst, and he had the chance to meet the director. So we were really glad about that. So Michael, thank you for your service, Michael. So, And you also told us when we were in there in the brief moment that you will sign, you, you will have 750 new agents in training going to school. Uh, and you cited the fact that in 2013, with the government shutdown, you don't now have the full complement of agents. But someone actually asked, other than more agents, what are the three tools or laws that you would like to see have see enacted that would help you the most in fighting uh, in combating terrorism? The biggest challenge we face today is the problem we call going dark, which is our increasing inability in terrorism cases and in our criminal work and in our counterintelligence work to get warrants complied with. That is, uh, when we encounter a device that's locked and we can't unlock it even with a search warrant, or we encounter communications, voice or text or data that are strongly encrypted and we can't decrypt it. And so the judge's order is, is uh, fruitless. We can intercept the actual, the, the ones and zeros, but we can't decrypt it. And that is, that's the hardest problem I've seen in government because it involves a collision of values. Hope everybody in this room cares about the same things. I know I do. Every one of us should care about safety and security on the internet. I'm an enormous fan of encryption. I think more people should use it. More people should be careful about their most important documents. If certain parts of the government would better encrypt their information, it would be harder for nation states to steal it and exploit it. It makes the FBI's job so much easier if people use encryption, as it does if, as if they, when they use their alarm systems at home, too. The second thing I hope everybody here cares about is public safety. The challenge we face is those are crashing into each other in the form of ubiquitous strong encryption. And that's m a, mostly a post-Snowden phenomenon. The, Sophisticated actors always had access to encryption, either to wrap data in or, or data in motion to encrypt. What's happened in the last three years is that's become the default. And there's a lot to love about that. The challenge for us is it's a new way to live for all of us as Americans. The, the fundamental bargain of this country 
is that absolute privacy does not exist. That your stuff is private unless the people of the United States need to see it. And then, with the appropriate predication and oversight, they can see it. Whether that's your sock drawer or your safe deposit box or your car or even the contents of your mind, you can be compelled to say what you saw. You can be compelled to talk about what you talked about with your lawyer in, in appropriate rare circumstances. Where we're headed now, which is what makes it so hard, large portions of our life are becoming absolutely private. As the devices we use, which are awesome, uh, become default encrypted. And so my view is you should never drift to a fundamental change in the way you live as a country. And so I just think we need to talk about it. I don't think it's the Bureau's job to say what we should do. But I think it's the Bureau's job to shout from the rooftops the tools you're counting on us to use, harder and harder to have them be effective. Very, very hard to figure out what to do about it. All kinds of complications about innovation, about technology, about international relations, all kinds of problems. It's the hairiest problem I've seen in government. But we have to stare at it and have an adult conversation about, so what could we do to optimize both of those values? And it's difficult because it's not susceptible to a tweet. It doesn't fit on a bumper sticker. It requires people to not demonize each other, but to sit down and say, okay, here's what I think, what do you think, and really talk about something. Whether our democracy is mature enough, definitely not mature enough this year to have it, I'm hoping maybe next year we can have that conversation, <laughs> but we need to have it, because we're drifting to a place, I don't want anyone to start looking at us and say, well, how come you didn't tell anybody that this thing was going on? So I'm telling people. And again, I'm not here to supply the answer, but I'm here to tell people serious people who care about how we live need to stare at this. At the end of the day, we may say, you know what? Absolute privacy brings us enough benefits that the costs associated with it are costs we should bear. But that should be a decision made by the people of the United States, not by the government, not by tech companies. Our job is public safety. Theirs is innovation and selling you stuff. You should decide how you want to live, uh, and we should help educate that conversation. That is the number one tool problem I have. That's actually not about our authorities. It's about whether our authorities are effective. So that's probably the number one. And it, and it dwarfs all the others when it comes to this challenges we face when it comes to counterterrorism. Seeing the threat is our biggest challenge, uh, both seeing it in that sense and where people are radicalizing in the privacy of their own homes, seeing it there. And then evaluating people, even those we come into contact with, our job is not just to find needles in a haystack. Our job is to find which pieces of hay might become a needle. And we aspire to be perfect. We really, really do. It's hard to be perfect. Very hard. But that's our goal, to be perfect. And we hold ourselves to that standard, which is why uh, your former employee now works in one of the hardest parts of the FBI, because all day, every day, we try to be perfect. I probably should stop there. Um, following on that, uh, what specifically would you recommend to the next administration w to do to combat cyber espionage uh, beyond what we're doing now vis-a-vis -vis China in particular, and what should we do to counter such state actors? I, I might add also at the bottom it says, uh, thank you for your service and for this lecture. So That's all the time we have. Thank you. Uh, uh, that's a really hard question. Um, and you have to think about it differently with different state actors. Uh, we've actually made some progress. It's too early to call uh, the ball here, but made some progress in conversations with the Chinese over the last 24 months with our prompted in a lot by a lot of things, including criminal charges against some of their actors stealing our innovation in order to make money and getting them to understand there's a framework that nations operate under and it goes like this. Nations collect intelligence on each other. Our job is to stop you, your job is to stop us. That's gone on since there were nations. What nations do not do in a civilized world is nations do not steal stuff to make money. They don't steal paint formulas, they don't steal designs for wind turbines so that companies in their country can make money. This is crime, this is statecraft. And getting to a place where that framework is understood with a, an enormous and great nation like China is an important accomplishment. Now, obviously there's a lot more work to do to see how that's borne out over time, but that was a question of talking and doing to send messages as we, as a community of nations, grope towards a set of norms. 
the reason I say you got to talk about different nations are other nations that are not, they're just different. North Korea, for example, where those kinds of conversations are not going to be productive. Uh, and so your toolbox may be different. You may be looking at different tools. But maybe the most important thing we can do is to figure out how to communicate better across the barrier between public and private in this country. The majority of companies in the United States that are the subject of cyber intrusions do not call us. And that's a terrible place to be. So we have to get to a place where that boundary between us is a boundary. But it has to become semi-permeable, consistent with law and policy, so we can talk to each other. And so we can incentivize people to tell us what's happening. Because you're kidding yourself if you think it'll go away if I just remediate the problem. Because they're going to come back to you, and they're going to victimize the rest of your neighborhood as well. And so we're making progress there. But that's a... We talk about the developing relationship between FBI and CIA. Developing trust with the private sector that we will not re-victimize you, that we will treat you like the victims that you are, we will respect you, we'll have honest conversations with you, we'll tell you what we're going to do with your information so you can make a cost-benefit analysis of whether you want to work with us. We had to do that similar thing between FBI and CIA. Long suspicion between our organizations, especially on the intelligence side, pure intelligence side, as to what the criminal side people would do with their information. We built that confidence over many, many years that we'll talk to each other, we'll protect sources and methods. We have to get to a similar place with the private sector because one of the great things about our country is the entire infrastructure is in private hands. That's a great thing, except when the bad guys are in the infrastructure and the people who own that infrastructure don't want to talk to us about what they see, so we can't help stop them. So that's our biggest challenge. Progress is being made, but it's not nearly good enough uh, because it's a we've connected our entire lives to the internet, so which is a great thing, but that means everything the FBI is responsible for is coming at us through that digital vector. Whether it's protecting kids, fighting fraud, fighting corruption, fighting espionage, or fighting terrorism. And that's, the, uh, that's a glimpse at our future, by the way. Our terrorist enemies have not yet figured out how they might use the internet to do us physical harm. Uh, some poking around at the edges, but as hard as we've made it for them to get into this country physically, they can get in as a photon at 186,000 miles per second, the speed of light, and potentially do grievous harm in lots of different ways that I'm sure you can imagine. That threat has not yet manifested itself, but it's one the FBI worries about all the time because logic would tell us it has to come. It has to come. Enjoy your evening. <laughs> so, I, respectful of your time, we'll, one last question to wrap up. Sure. It's, a, it's a thorny political question. I, the last one. We didn't talk about Hillary Clinton's email. No, 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 I can't no, no, leave. No, no, no. You stole my line. It's just I not. Can't leave until we. I never not, tire of that. Never. It, 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 it's not about her emails. That's the good news. It, this is a question. It says, "My son will be of voting age in 2020. Will you be on the presidential ballot?" <laughs> And if so, for which party? That doesn't say here, but the other question is, what are you going to tell your wife? No way. <laughs> Not my thing. No, never, ever, ever will I run for office. And I don't want to explain why, because I'll insult all kinds of politicians, but it's just not my thing. It's not my thing. So uh, thanks for that. Focus on something else. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, great. Thank you. It's great.